Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Julia Caro, Managing Editor here at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Genome-Wide Study Reveals a Novel Regulatory Pathway, Translation Effects mRNA Stability in a Codon-Dependent Manner. This webinar is sponsored by Lexogen. Our speaker today is Dr. Ariel Bazzini, an assistant investigator at the Stowers Institute for Medical Research. You may type in a question. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar, and you can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of your webinar presentation. And we will ask our speaker your questions after his presentation has concluded. Also, if you look at the bottom tray of your window, you will find a number of widgets that can enhance your webinar experience. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Bazzini. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks so much, Julia, for the interaction, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my work. So today I'm going to talk about um, how translation actually affects gene expression uh, in vertebrates. And I would like to start saying that, you know, we know that the information is in the DNA and it should be transcribed into the messenger RNA to then get translated into proteins. And usually, you know, when we think about RNA level, most of the time we are thinking about that is mainly regulated by transcription. So I'd like to do this analogy, you know, with this container where, you know, it's important to know how much RNA or how much water you have in this container. You know, of course, it's very important to know how much water we're putting in, but also it's very important to know, to know how much water are we losing. And we can start thinking you know, in situations where even though we have the same level of transcription, we can have very different level of RNA decay, and that will strongly affect actually how much RNA we have in a given cell. And you know, that is uh, one of the things that we are very interested in the lab. So my lab works in understanding how genes are regulated at the post-transcriptional level in vertebrate. And I usually like to summarize that in two different um, features or, or phenomena. One is the, what I have just mentioned about the half-life of the RNA. We can have one RNA that is very stable. And you can also have RNA that are very unstable. And independent of how much you RNA you transcribe, that will affect the RNA level that we will have at homeostasis. The other feature that we are always very interested in is in understanding how genes are translated. We can also have another situation where two RNAs are exactly the, has exactly the same level of RNA, but one can be very efficiently translated and therefore you're going to produce a lot of protein, while the other one might be very poorly translated and will not be producing so much protein. So if we do something like RNA-seq, for example, we might think that those two genes are, you know, have the same level of RNA and they're regulated or not regulated, but they actually very different. At the, they might be very different at the level of translation. And all the post-transcriptional regulation is very important because there's a lot of factors such as microRNAs, or uneven in protein, that they can affect either you know, the RNA level, you know, the stability, or the level of translation, and then can be related with very, very important processes such as development, cancer, metabolism, virus infection, or neurodegenerative disease. And my lab, we're trying to understand how factors and how genes are regulated at the post-transcriptional level. And thinking about post-transcriptional level, I like to think, I mean, I usually say that, you know, the canonical view has been focused in the three prime tier. So most uh, RNAs in our cells, they contain a five prime cap, followed by a three prime tier, five prime tier, followed by the coding uh, sequence that here is in, oh, sorry, there was some problem. This one slide disappeared, but you know we have um, the, the coding sequence, and then we have the three prime tier that is enriched in um, elements that can be recognized by either microRNAs or RNA binding proteins, and those elements can cause translation repression or RNA decay. 
So we are, most of the effort has been always thinking the three parameters to see how genes are regulated at the post transcriptional level. But you know, a few years ago, I asked a very nice question when I was doing my postdoctoral training at Yale University with Antonio Giraldes. There was, could it be that translation also affect RNA instability? So the ribosome is one of the most abundant RNA binding protein in the cell. And, you know, RNA binding proteins in the 3 PMTR, they recognize an element, you know, a given sequence or a given structure. But we know that the ribosome also recognizes, you know, a, 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 the genetic code. Basically, you know, the ribosome is reading the coding sequence every three nucleotide, and it's translated information from the code from the three nucleotide um, uh, nucleotide to the amino acid. So we wonder what translation could also affect RNA stability. And to make the story pretty short, you know, we have found that within the genetic code, there's an extra layer of information that was talking about regulatory information. I was talking about the stability of the RNA. And you know what we see here in red are columns that we define as optimal, and in blue are columns that we define as non-optimal. And this is a mechanism, a process that has been described first in NIST by Jeff Kohler, where, which has been referred as current optimality, where now transcripts that are rich in these red corons are going to be more stable, they're going to have longer poly and they're going to be efficiently, very efficiently translated. On the other hand, genes enriching non-optimal corons <coughs> were, uh, unest are unstable, contain short poly and are poorly translated. Um, it's very important to mention that this is not coron bias, this is not coron usage, this is coron optimal. We can have the corons that are actually pretty frequently used, but they are actually non-optimal. So coron optimality is the intrinsic property of a given coron to affect the RNA stability in a translation-dependent manner. And, you know, when we found this in yeast, I mean, sorry, in, in zebrafish and xenopus, the first question that we wanted to address, okay, you know, how strong this mechanism is, is, and does it play any role in any biological context? And the, one of the biological contexts that we study is the maternal to zygotic transition. You know, I don't know how familiar you are with this transition, but in all animals, you know, um, the, the maternal to zygotic transition exists. And you know, after fertilization, your father gave you half of your genes, your mother have gave you the other half of the genes, but your mother also gave you an incredible amount of RNA. In the case of zebrafish, more than 50% of the transcriptome is maternally provided. And in all animals, after fertilization, the genome is absolutely silenced, so we don't have any transcription. And we, you know, the first stage depend exclusively on the RNA and the proteins that the, the mother has provided. At some point, in the case of zebrafish, three hours post-fertilization, the genome gets activated, and now the maternal RNA needs to get degraded. This is, of course, a very fundamental uh, transition in, in, in embryogenesis. I mean, if you don't uh, pass this transition correctly, the embryo will never form. But from the molecular point of view, this also for us very interesting because we can analyze how thousands of messenger RNAs get actually degraded in the in vivo system. And you know, it has been shown that a single microRNA, for example, in the case of zebrafish, Antonio Giraldo Joe showed that a single microRNA called MIR430 gets psychotically expressed, and that target recognized and you know degrade around 1,000 messenger RNAs. But we didn't know. And we couldn't explain the, last, the, 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 the large majority of the maternal RNA, and then we find actually the current optimality is taking care of most of the maternal RNA when we can easily see that you know, thousands of RNAs are degraded based in the current composition. Maternal RNAs that are enriching these non-optimal corons, they decay faster, and maternal RNA that are enriching these optimal corons, they decay very slowly. And this is in Xenopus and mouse, zebrafish, and, and fly. But you know, this was zebrafish, and what we really want to address when I opened my lab less than three years ago was where the current optimality exists in human. So the question was, where does translation affect RNA stability in human cells in a current dependent manner? And you know, the, specifically, we want to see what is so where the current optimality exists in human cells, what is the code, which are the good and bad codons, how strong is this mechanism in cells, and you know, 
if we can learn more about the molecular mechanism of how translation affects our instability. And if, so to answer which conos are good and which conos are bad, we have taken the same approach that we took in zebrafish and xenoput, and previously was described in yeast, um, where basically imagine that you can, and I'm going to explain how, but imagine that you have a profile of R instability, and now each of these uh, gray dots is going to be one gene, and now you can analyze, you know, what is the correlation between R instability and the occurrence of a given coron. For example, the first case in red, the coron GTG, uh, we can see there's a positive, you know, this is a cartoon, this is a, there's a positive correlation between the occurrence of GTG and R instability. That means that genes that are enriching GTG, they tend to be very stable. In that case, you know, if you calculate the correlation, you are, we are basically calculating what um, Jeff Kohler has done in East, what's called the coron stabilization coefficient, and that would say that this coron is optimal because it has a positive correlation. For example, in the case in the, of the blue one, the CAT, we see a negative correlation. That means that genes enriching CAT, they tend to be unstable. So you can do this, you know, 61 times, one for every single uh, coding colon, and you will get which colons are good and which colons are bad. However, you know, measuring our instability is not simple and could be noisy. So we are going to I'm going to show you that we have uh, used three independent methods to measure our instability in different cell types. So the first one that we took it was maybe the simpler one. We took, in this case, 293 HeLa and RP cells, all of them are human cells. We treat them with actinodomycin D. Actinodomycin is a drug that will come to repress transcription. So after treating with the cells with this drug, you will not have a transcription. And then you can start taking samples, you know, two, four, six hours after the treatment, perform RNA seq, and then you know, after transcription, the RNA can only go down because you cannot, you are not generating the novel RNA. So you do multiple RNA seq, and then you calculate the decay of more than 10,000 RNAs. Um, uh, messenger RNAs per, per cell type. So this is one way, but this one has the problem or the disadvantage that, you know, when you're treating with actinodomycin, you can have pleiotropic, pleiotropic effect and because you're basically blocking transcription. So that's when we find out about this technique. It's called SLAMSIC that has been uh, first described by the Amaris lab, and Lexogen has a kit that is very straightforward. What we really like from this technique is that, you know, in this case, you're not blocking transcription. See? So this is absolutely independent of that in other ways in D. So just to go through the technique, and the final goal is going to be uh, to measure the half-life or the decay of the messenger RNA. So in this case, we took uh, KF62 cells. These cells are in suspension. Uh, we feed them every three hours for, for 24 hours with 4 thio UTP. This is a modified nucleotide. The idea that after feeding the cell for 24 hours, you will have most of your RNA label is what you can see there in green uh, uh, tiny balls. And so most of the RNA will be labeled. And after 24 hours, then you wash out and you start taking samples at different time points. The idea that you know, the label RNA, that can be like the old RNA, will, you know, the ones that uh, the sooner or later, they will be, get degraded. And so over time, you will be losing the mark. And they say, the, messenger RNAs that are very unstable, they will be losing the mark much faster than the genes that, that the messenger RNAs that are very stable. So after collecting the samples at different time points, the good thing of what I also that I really like from this method that you're not pulling down as other methods. When, and usually when you're pulling down, you know, the pull downs are not very clean. In this case, you do a biochemistry treatment where now the use will be read as C. And then you sequence your RNA, and here, rather than use RNA-seq, we use quant-seq. This is another kit from Lexogen. With, what I really like for this one is that you only sequence the three prime UTR, the three prime end, sorry, of the messenger RNAs. And that means that each transcript is one read, and therefore you have much higher coverage. And then with the analysis that you, know, you need to do is basically what is the um, T to C tr um, transition, because now the ones that, you know, they lose the mark very fast are going to be the ones that are very unstable, and the transcripts that will not lose the mark so fast will be more stable. So, you know, using different cutoff, we can identify, calculate the decay or half-life of around 8,000 messenger RNAs in case of you. You know, because this is a pretty new uh, technique, you know, there's a lot of steps that you need to check that you are know, doing correctly. For example, the, f the first one is 
let me see if this works. Well, basically, you want to see that the T2C transition is specific. So in the upper uh, left um, panel, you can see that from all the potential transition, the only one that is significant is the T2C only when you provide for thio UTP. All the other ones are not significant, just you show that you know, the effect is, you know, is, is specific. The other thing that you want to show is that you know, the T2C transition decreases over time because, as, as mentioned before, you know, after washing out, I mean, you should be losing the signal because the, label, the already labeled messenger RNAs will get degraded faster or, or you know, sooner or later, but they will, should get degraded. And you, of course, need to have replicate. You also, you know, because fourth IU to be, you know, can be toxic. You, you know, then there's a kit that you can actually get to titrate the concentration. But it's, I think it's also always very good to do an RNA seq with and without fourth IU to be to, to see that you know you have a strong correlation of gene expression. And finally, because we had never used the quant seq, um, we have then done in parallel regular RNA seq and see that you know our quantification of gene expression correlate. So, you know, in summary, now we have these uh, interesting techniques, SLAMSIC or two, that we can measure half-life or instability in an actinodomycin the independent manner. And, you know, we wanted to do one more technique before we jump into which corners are good and which corners are bad. And, you know, this was originated from a previous work that we have published in, in, in Zebrafish, where, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that the stability of the RNA can be you know, affected by regulatory LA meaning the five and, and three premium tier. So we wanted to identify to measure the RNA stability independent of the UTRs. And you know, as mentioned before, in Zebrafish you have a kind of a similar technique, but you know each system has advantage and disadvantage. In the case of cells, we uh, we, we develop a new method which we call it the Orpheum, where basically we use the Orpheum library. It's not that we we create the name. In this Orpheum library, we have more than 17,000 constructs. All of them share exactly the same promoter, and they have the same five and three premium TR. And the only thing that is changing is the current composition. It means we have 17 plasmid that each of them express a different open ring frame from human, and you can use them for overexpression experiment. But interestingly, this library contains a barcode in the three premium TR. Those are the tiny boxes that you see that they share the same color. Now, the idea is that you can, you know, we infect using the antivirus, 293 and K562 cells. Then you select the cells that have been infected. Then you treat them with actinodomycin D again. In this case, you know, we block transcription. And then you collect similar from the first approach that I mentioned, you know, samples at different time post treatment. But now, rather than do regular RNA-seq, and then we will need you know, to develop some kind of uh, analysis, a uh, pipeline to discriminate between the exogenous, the one that we are infecting, you know, we're expressing through the orphan with the same uh, regulatory element in the three and, and promoters, to, the, you know, to discriminate those from the endogenous messenger RNA. We do it a little bit different sequencing when we, you know, we take the advantage that everybody has the same three premium tier. So we design oligos with Illumina adapters to amplify only the Orpheum messenger RNAs and to sequence those barcodes. Of course, if we know the barcode, if you can quantify the, bar the barcodes after sequencing, you know which barcode corresponds to which open ring frame, and we, we knew which cones those open ring frame had. So basically doing RNA-seq from the barcodes, we can, you know, over time, we can calculate the decay of more than 10,000 RNAs over time, independent of the three premium tier. And one more slide before we go into which corons are good and which corons are bad, I want to say that, you know, this Orpheum um, technique can also help to study elements in the three premium tier, because, for example, on the right, we have, you know, an endogenous messenger RNA that you know, has the endogenous 5 and 3 premium TR. And let's think that this transcript can be methylated, for example. You know, M6A, you know, methylation of the RNA in the 3 premium TR has been shown to decrease the stability of the RNA. So now if we compare the endogenous, um, this endogenous gene with its counterpart in the Orpheum, the Orpheum version will not have the 3 premium TR. Therefore, if the M6A is in the 3 premium TR, we will lose that methylation. And now this transcript should be a little bit more stable in the Orpheum 
experiment than in the endogenous one. And that is exactly what we have seen with the 293 and case 62 When we see here, uh, we have in gray the non-target of, um, of M6A, and in color we have the target of M6A. And you know, as you see in all the endogenous slam seek as well as the endogenous 293, we have a very strong difference between genes that can get methylated with the ones that are not, you know, showing that, you know, illustrating that M6A can affect our uh, RNA stability. But interestingly, when we take those same genes in the old film, either in 293 and KF662, we see that those differences are get, becomes much, much, much narrow, suggesting that now you know you can compare the endogenous with the old film, and you can start bashing or analyzing the three premier to see what you can potentially have element. But you know that was not part of the goal of this this paper. What we really want to see what was the relation between the RNA stability and the current composition using three different methods. You know the ones when we block. Uh, um, Transcription, the slam seek when it's independent of the of the uh, of the drug, and the orphium when it's independent of the three permitter. And interestingly, what we saw in all the cell lines with all the techniques that we use, there was some corons that has a positive correlation. That's the ones that call optimal corons that were, you know, we see positive correlation. Remember, means that genes enriching those particular corons they tend to be more stable. And we also find gene, corons that were and reach uh, in genes that were unstable, uh, unstable, sorry. And so this is what we call the coron optimality code. In red are the good corons, in blue are the bad corons. There was the first evidence suggesting that in human cells, coron optimality exists. And this code correlates with what we have seen in zebrafish and Xenopus before. But you know, when you are talking about corons, it's always very important to be sure that the information is in the coron and not just is a nucleotide bias. So, you know, to answer this question, where the RNA stability was depending in the corons and not in the nucleotide sequence, we designed a pair of reporters, and we'll see that we will use the same kind of game during the, the talk. We have, you know, transcripts that contain only one open ring frame. It goes from M cherry to the end of the optimal or non-optimal region. So the ribosome will read through the whole open ring frame. But when, and we will always have, at the, in the five prime, we'll have an M cherry or GFP, depending on the report that we use. And when the ribosome pass through the P2A signal, now the M cherry or GFP will be released. So the folding of the, of the fluorescent protein will never depend in what we have downstream the P2A. Of course, if what we have downstream the P2A, optimal or non-optimal, affect the stability of the entire transcript, then of course the, the level of M cherry, uh, of GFP will be affected. And now after the B2A, these two pairs of reporters, they have exactly the same sequence. I hope you can see there that the only difference in this, uh, between these two pairs is that G that we, we insert there. It could be any nucleotide that you want. doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be G. It could be whatever you want. But the important thing is that when you insert one nucleotide, you change the frame of translation. So the ribosome in one case is reading one frame, and in the second transcript, when it's called the non-optimal, it's reading in, the sec in a different frame. And the way that we have designed these two transcripts, one is enriching optimal colon, and the other one is enriching non-optimal colon. So as a summary, we have two transcripts where they have exactly the same nucleotide. You know, which these guys are more than 1.5 kb long. They have exactly the same nucleotide composition, the same sequence, the only thing that's different is one nucleotide and therefore the coron composition. And interestingly, when we transfect this, we co transfect this with GFPS internal control, we see that always the, the messenger in reaching the optimal coron is more stable than the non optimal. And actually, when we see at homeostasis, we see that the optimal express high level of, you know, accumulate half level of RNA as well as protein. And if they, in the protein density, you can see that independent if you put a G, A, C, or T, you always get more protein than if you don't put anything because the, the four bars in red are enriching optimal corons, and the one in blue is enriching non-optimal corons. So this was experiment that we, we used to prove that the information is in the corons and not in the nucleotide. And I'm not putting here, but if you block translation, of course, those two transcripts behave exactly the same because now if we block translation, there's no coron optimality because there's no corons, and then the nucleotide composition is what's going to drive the stability of those transcripts, and this one has exactly the same nucleotide composition. 
So after this, you know, we wanted to address what the information was now in the colon or in the amino acid. And this uh, question came from previous work that we have done also in zebrafish. So this is basically the same heat map that I showed you before. Now I'm just sorting by amino acid. And I hope that you can see that, in, for example, in the case of xenopus and zebrafish, this is our previous work, you can see that in glycine, leucine, or serine, in both embryos, we see that all the synonymous colon basically share the same color. Let's say glycine, all of them are red, suggesting that glycine can potentially be an optimal amino acid. Leucine or serine, they're all blue, suggesting that those amino acids could potentially be a non-optimal amino acid. Of course, it's very hard to say if it's amino acid of the core, but at least if they all share the same optimality, that suggests that the amino acid might potentially have a role. However, when we analyze the human, that was not the case. In most of the cases, we see that amino acids contain optimal and non-optimal corals. And these are just a few examples. However, there's few, such histidine and serine, where in most of the profile, we could see that uh, they share the same optimal. In the case of histidine, all of them are always, are always blue. It means that histidine could potentially be uh, taken as a non-optimal amino acid. But now to show that the information is mainly in the corons, we start playing with synonymous mutation. So this is very similar from the report that I showed you before. But now rather than have the same nucleotide composition, well, we, the only difference between the optimal and the non-optimal region is that the, we have synonymous mutation. So in this case, for example, this, you know, we try to control our report as much as we can, but it's impossible to, com you know, to control all, all the features. So in the previous one, we had the same nucleotide composition, but of course they were producing completely different proteins. In this one, they are ex expressing exactly the same protein, but they do have different nucleotide composition. And I hope that you can see in the northern blot and also you know, the, uh, in, in our cytometry analysis when we analyze first in intensity that depending in, in the proportion of optimal and non-optimal columns that you pick, you can modify the stability of the RNA tremendously. So this is for us strongly suggesting that at least for the amino acid that we have been uh, playing in these reporters, you know, especially leucine, isoleucine, cysteine, you can um, affect on stability based in synonymous corons, suggesting that this for those amino acids, uh, the contribution of the amino acid in the stability of the RNA is minimum. After that, you know, we also wanted to an try to analyze um, the effect of a single coron. And you know, in all the profile and all the reports that I show you, we are always you know taking genes that contain multiple corons, and you know. Unfortunately, the ribosome cannot read, you know, we cannot make an open reinfluent that is only, you know, uh, uh, only contain one single codon in, in a tandem because the ribosome likely will not read that. But we have tricked the system a little bit and we have created this uh, report that we call them the mini genes. In this case, you know, rather than MCR, we have GFP, but basically it's the same. P2A, and then we have a region that we call the mini genes. And ideally, you can think, you know, we would love to have 61 different mini genes, one from each colon. But let's just, you know, think about the first one and the last one. In the mini gene that we call CTG, we have after the P2A 61 CTG, but between each of them we have a different colon. So we never have CTG3 you know, in tandem. Now, if you look in the CAT mini gene, it's basically the same backbone, but now rather than the 61 CTG, you have 61 CAT. And because you know we can compare between mini genes, but you know the, con the nucleotide composition is completely different. So we have done a pair, you know, a counterpart um, report that would do basically for each of them, we create a premature stop colon after the PQA. So now, for example, you can compare how the CTG will be expressed when you allow translation of the mini gene or when we abolish the translation of the mini gene because you have put a premature stop code. And that is exactly what we see in the bar plot. And for example, here we can evidence, if I'm going to just mention the leucine uh, amino acid, where now the mini gene encoding from CTG looks to be optimal because it's expressing much higher than the mutant counterpart, where the nucleotide, once again, is exactly the same but the mini gene part that, that does not get translated. Uh, while the TTG or CTT uh, mini gene, you know, the mutant and the Walton version express the same. You know, ideally, we might expect that the translation of the mini gene enriching non-optimal will give you lower level of expression, but you know, 
On the other hand, as I mentioned, we try to um, control our report as much as we can, but in this case, of course, the length of the 3 pm can also have an effect. But now, you see, for those three mini genes from leucine, all of them expressing the, you know, exactly the same peptide, but we can easily see that one coron is optimal, the others are non optimal, and that's match exactly with the, our genome wide profile. I would like to mention that, for example, in the case of histidine, the last two, CAC and CAT, once again, both look to be non optimal. So both genomic uh, profiles and our report suggest that, you know, both coron from histidine. Uh, look to be non-optimal, suggesting that maybe histidine has some effect in, in RNA stability. You know, now, you know, thinking more about the coronals, of course, one obvious question was what how we know with tRNAs. And, you know, it has been proposed that the, you know, the, the tRNA um, supply-demand uh, relation can be involved in the stability of the RNA. And, you know, of course, the, 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 the rationale was that, well, Optimal corons might have a high level of tRNA than non-optimal corons, and that is exactly what we have found first in zebrafish, where you know, in the box plot that you have on your right, you know, a few years ago, we showed that the optimal uh, corons, you know, the tRNAs that are encoding for the optimal corons present higher level uh, of tRNAs than the non-optimal. And now, when in human, we analyze two different um, data sets measuring tRNAs. We also see a, correl a positive correlation where optimal corons tend to be uh, <coughs> recognized by tRNAs that are highly expressed. However, you see that the correlations are not strictly strong. However, if you now compare the tRNA level quantification from both techniques, the correlations are not very strong. And this is because you know quantifying tRNA level is really hard especially because they have a very strong structure and because they are heavily modified. And, you know, <clears throat> thinking in the modification of the RNA, we can, rather than start to, you know, rather than thinking the level of DNA, we can also think in the quality of the DNA. And the quality of the DNA, I, I, we like to divide it in two parts. One are all the modifications that the, the RNA modification that the DNA has. And so far we have not... Um, done any, any big experiment on that front. But the other way of thinking about the quality of the tRNA, you know, tRNAs, they get charged with the amino acid, and the charged tRNA is the one that the ribosome is using. So we can start thinking in a scenario that even though if you have exactly the same level of tRNA, maybe, you know, if you have one, TR, you know, one type of tRNA that is heavily uh, charged, and the other one is not almost charged, so, you know, I would think that the optimal would be the one that is going to be charged because the non, if you are not charged, you will not be able to get, um, will not be able to be used by the ribosome. And from there, we also analyze, you know, publish a profile about tRNA charge ratio. And we, interestingly, we also found a positive correlation, you know, supporting this hypothesis that optimal colonies are translated by tRNAs that are uh, very efficiently charged or we have high ratio of charged tRNA. Interestingly, you know, the four less um, charged tRNAs are four from serine, and remember that serine was the amino acid that could potentially be defined as non-optimal because all the colons were um, were defined as non-optimal, suggesting that maybe you know, charging the tRNA might be another way of affecting the optimality of those tRNAs, and those will be affecting the stability of the transcriptome of the transcriptome at, at the transcriptome level. Such as in the new tRNA, very likely are playing a role stabilizing uh, RNA, RNAs, and you can start thinking that tRNAs, rather than a passive players, might be actually master regulator genes. Then you're know, going more into the molecular mechanism of uh, of how translation affects RNA stability. For us, you know, one of the obvious uh, way to go is to analyze the polyethyl. You know, it has been proposed that the length of the polyethyl can be affected, you know, can be dictating the stability of the RNA. So the question was where we see a correlation between the current optimality and the length of the polyethyl. And our previous work, <coughs> excuse me, in zebrafish have shown that we do see a strong correlation. In this case, 
These are two reporters, very similar from what I showed before. They have the same nucleotide composition, but completely different codon composition. And what you are seeing on your right, this is a technique that we also described a few years ago, where you can measure the length of the poly ATL in a single nucleotide level. So you see that after one hour, and so we have in, um, done in vitro transcribed RNA, and we have injected those into zebrafish embryos. So in that case, it's absolutely there's no regulation of the level of transcription because we inject the, uh, the RNA into the embryo. And you know, in the f first hour, you see that you know basically we inject optimal and non-optimal with basically the same poly ATL. But four hours later, we can still see that the we can already see that the messenger RNAs enriching optimal codons actually contain much longer poly uh, uh, than the messenger RNA enriching non-optimal. And by eight hours, the difference are even higher, and we already know by northern blood that the non-optimal construct by eight hours is almost gone. So we do see that you know, for genes where we control everything on the nucleotide, we could see the difference in the length of the poly -etal. Interestingly, when we analyze genome-wide uh, the length of the polyethyl, you know, with different techniques has been reported, as well, you know, and we have also analyzed in, in, Zenopus, in zebrafish, we always find a pretty strong correlation that, you know, genes enriching optimal codons, the ones that are more stable, they tend to have longer polyethyl than genes enriching non-optimal. This could also be shown in, in yeast. The problem, you know, for us, you know, was very interesting to see the correlation, but <clears throat> that is a simple correlation. And we wanted to address what the poly ATL is actually required for the current optimality, or it was just a correlation. And you know, to answer that question, basically what we have done is use our the same reporters. These are the ones that have the same nucleotide sequence but different coron um, composition, and that we knew that we if we use this with the you know, poly ATL signal, we you know the optimal is more stable than the optimal. But then we wanted to address what happened, what is the, the regulatory behavior of those pairs of, of reporters when we use a histone tail rather than poly tail. And you know, histone mess, some histones, messenger RNAs, contain histone tail, and that is a, you know, it's a pretty strong structure that gives you a very sharp end. So there's no poly tail, they do not, these are the, one of the few RNAs in our cells that do not contain a poly tail. And the question was how those reporters with histone tests will behave in both human as well as zebrafish. And interestingly, we have observed that independent if you have a poly -A tail or a histone tail, we always see that the messenger enriching optimal codons are more stable than the non-optimal. I hope that you can see in the northern blood in your left that when, even though when we use histone tails, you know, now the, the RNAs are very sharp because the tail is very sharp, but we still see that the optimal, the, the messenger RNA enriching optimal codons are more stable than the ones enriching non-optimal. And we have found that in human. <clears throat> Those are the first two panelists in your left. But then we have seen exactly the same in zebrafish. For example, I hope that you can see that the, the MCR is, you know, is the, the, sorry, the GFP is the internal control. The MCR is the, the reported that are enriching either optimal or non-optimal. And independent, if we use the poly tail or the histone, always the reporter enriching the poly in the, in the optimal codons are more stable and therefore we have higher level of MGRE. You know, suggesting that the poly is not required, was not essential for the codon optimality mechanism. However, we do see a very strong correlation genome-wide suggesting that that might be a, a, a secondary effect uh, that those RNAs are getting degraded or getting unstable. After this, you know, going a little bit more about the mechanism, but also we are very interested to see, okay, can, can the coron optimality differentially uh, affect gene expression? You know, is this a code and this is an effect that is going to be fixed, or in different cellular conditions we can potentially have different effects? And of course, you can start thinking that playing with tRNAs, and we can talk more in the questions, playing with tRNAs can have a profound effect <coughs> in RNA stability. But also, you know, the tRNAs look to be important, but also translation is crucial. We knew, we know, and we show that if you block translation, all these differences in RNA stability and gene expression disappear. So the simple question was, could it be that now the level of translation is important? And in the cartoon in the left, <clears throat> the idea that, you know, we already show you a lot of reporters that if, you know, 
they weren't reaching optimal, so they're more stable, and therefore you have higher level of RNA and proteins that are not optimal. But now, if we start reducing the level of translation, and that means the, how many ribosomes we can load into a given messenger RNA. Now, we can hypothesize that now, if you have a messenger RNA enriching optimal colon, and you start reducing the level of translation, that messenger RNA will be actually be losing stability. On the other hand, if your transcript is enriching non-optimal colons and you're reducing the level of translation, you actually are increasing stability. And this is, I think, a big difference between other regulatory pathways that we and others have studied. You know, if we're thinking in microRNAs, basically microRNAs are negative regulators. If you reduce, let's say, the amount of microRNAs, now everybody will become, all the target of that particular microRNA will become more stable. Here is not the case. You can call an optimality can positive and negatively regulate gene expression. So depending always in which cons do you have. So one way to illustrate um, this was to use the same report that I showed you before, but now so the coding regions are going to be always fixed. And the only thing that's going to change are the UTRs. We will use either strong or weak UTRs, and strong and weak means how, you know, based on our ribosome profiling, we, f we fish them from endogenous genes, and the strong can drive high level of translation, and the weak can drive low level of translation. And interestingly, we can see that the effect in current optimality depends on the level of translation. If we use a very strong uh, 5 prime UTR, driving high level of translation, the differences between optimal and non-optimal are much higher. And if we use a very weak, uh, um, five prime UTR, you know, those differences get diluted completely. And, you know, these are reporters. We also always like to use reporters because we can control everything. But, you know, the question is, could we find this in vivo in a cellular situation where, for example, translation can get compromised? And virus infections can do that. So it is beautiful work where they have done ribosome profiling during H H uh, HSV um, infection, and they have actually shown, you know, this is translation efficiency in the box plot in the white boxes. You can see that the translation efficiency of the endogenous genes get repressed during HSV infection. So for us, you know, that thinking in the cartoons, okay, during time, basically, we are moving, you know, from the high level of translation to a lower level of translation. And therefore, we should expect that, you know, transcriptome wild optimal and non-optimal should get together. And that was exactly what we found. So in the cumulative plot that you're seeing in the bottom part of the, of the slide, in red, so we are plotting the RNA level, in red are the top 500 genes highly enriching optimal codon, in blue are the ones enriching non-optimal codon, as expected, you know, the optimal should you know, express high level of, uh, of RNA than in an optimal, very likely due RNA stability. And interestingly, when we take the, you know, always the same group of genes and we analyze it during a infection, we see that the differences between the optimal and non-optimal get diluted. And specifically, if we see the box plot the, uh, on top, the genes enriching optimal colon, they actually are losing on a level over ex or, um, during virus infection, and the group of genes enriching non-optimal codons actually increase the RNA, relatively speaking, the RNA level during virus infection. So we see exactly the same thing that we have seen with our reporters, that now if we reduce the level of translation, genes in, 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 uh, enriching optimal codons become less stable, but actually genes enriching non-optimal codons become more stable. And you know, those are just the beginning. We can start thinking that you know, other processes such as you know, aging or cancer that can potentially affect um, genome-wide the RNA stability. After that, you know, we also wanted, you know, we have to start thinking now, and this is unpublished work, now the stability of the RNA is, RNA is not coming from the 3 prime UTR or from the coding. The stability is coming from the entire messenger RNA. And you have to start thinking if it's M6A, microRNA, or coron optimality, and we have to combine all of them. And we can actually start seeing that genes, in, for example, regulated by either M6A or microRNA in Xenopus, zebrafish, and human, we can still see the coron optimality effect, suggesting that you know, the coron optimality is like an umbrella program where it actually affect, potentially affect every single coron, coding, coding um, messenger RNA, and then we have to understand what is the connection between the 3 prime UTR and the coding sequence. 
to to finish, you know, I hope I can um, show you the, to show you that you know, of course, the most important function of the ribosome is to produce proteins. It has also been shown that translation is very important for quality control to you know trigger decay of RNAs that are not uh, properly uh, processed. But current optimality is a process, is a way or a mechanism to affect gene expression of genes that are absolutely perfectly processed and can have a tremendous effect in gene expression. And if we are thinking about the upstream regulator of current optimality, I think it's fair to say that likely the sum of tRNA level, tRNA charge ratio, and the amino acid, therefore the tRNA that is ready to go is going to be likely the one that is going to be affecting the stability of, of the RNA. But this is absolutely dependent in translation. So we also need to know, you know what is the level of translation of that given messenger RNA or gene in a cellular condition. And the downstream effect of this is, I show you, even though the polyethyl doesn't look to be essential, we see that there's a DNA relation, there's decay, and therefore at homeostasis, we can see that genes enriching optimal codons display higher level of RNA and protein, and genes enriching non-optimal actually display at homeostasis lower level of both RNA and protein. And it has been also shown that protein folding can be affected by the codon composition. And just you know, thinking in the future, I think there's a few things that I would like to mention. It's going to be very exciting to see what is the biological relevance of the current optimality in different tissues with the aging, in stresses. We, so far, we have analyzed one virus, and of course, doing cancer, and how translation is regulated in all those um, contexts, related also with the level of tRNA and how tRNAs are regulated and thinking in the role of tRNA, in a very active role, or regulatory role of tRNA, rather than just a passive role that, you know, sometimes we think that the tRNAs are going to be there to, to translate. Also, it's going to be crucial to identify what is the molecular mechanism, what is the factors that are affecting our stability in a current dependent manner. And finally, you know, we're also very inter interesting, and we are analyzing what are the rules of the current optimality? You know, this is not as simple as these are blue and red, you know, blue are good and bad. There's so many other things that are playing a role. With the position, it's not the same to have a current at the beginning or at the end. And thinking a little bit more in the future, you know, if we can start analyzing and understanding all these rules, we could potentially start helping predicting or associating genes mutation with diseases. You know, usually if you have a, a mutation and you, you generate a premature stop coron, of course, you know, that's a very good candidate to get associated with a disease. But if you have a synonymous mutation, you know, most of the time those cannot be analyzed. And I think now if we continue, you know, doing our research, we might be able to, to help in that front. And for that, I mean, you know, I've run out of time. I would like to thanks. This is probably the most important achievement I have done in the almost three years that we opened the lab, to find these amazing scientists that have done all the works. I also would like to thank the Stower Institute uh, for Medical Research because, you know, especially thanks to the amazing facility that we have here, we were able to do, you know, some of the, the profiles and experiments that I, I show you today and some of the projects that we are running in the lab. And with that, I would like also to announce that, you know, we have uh, a PhD program that is, I found it very, very, very good. It's a very different way of learning, uh, teaching, and, and, and work. I will strongly recommend students from all the world. We have students from, you know, from, from so many different countries to take a look if you might like it. Uh, we also have a second uh, program. It's called the Summer Scholar Program, where now the students or candidates can come for you know, 10 weeks to work in the institute, see how we work, see what kind of research do we do, see if they like it, and then they can also um, then apply for if they want to our PhD program. These are 10 weeks that are completely paid from their ticket to, you know, stipend and everything that they need. And, you know, so far now, actually now this month, we have around 35 students in the institute. And um, for that, I would like just one, one again, Julia, to thank you for the invitation. And it was great. And if there's any question, I would be more than happy to talk about it. Great. Thank you so much for this nice presentation, Ariel. Um, again, as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. And I would also like to ask our attendees to take a very brief moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and provide us with your feedback. So with that, let's go into the Q&A. 
uh, we have quite a number of technical questions. Um, so here's one regarding the method or kit that you used for the Orpheum PCR, specifically for the exogenously expressed ORS. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so this is a you know, technique basically that, that we develop. Um, basically, you know, we first, so, you know, we got the library, we mix them all together. You know, of course, you can never assume that you will have exactly the same amount of each of them, but then you will normalize it. And then we have create, you know, all, we have uh, create a lengthy virus population. That means that we have packed the entire library. We don't, we did not infect one by one, of course. Eh? We just did one infection with the 17,000. After that, you, you know, this guy, this library contains pyromycin resistant gene, so you can select them with a pyromycin for a few days, and the selection works very well. And after that, we treat with actinodomycin. We collect the different samples. And then we have invested a little bit of, of time to see, you know, I mentioned that in the three, so for the piece, so then we have done a regular cDNA. But then when we amplified that cDNA, we took a little bit of time to be able to design oligos in, the, in those three parameters surrounding the barcode to first have a small PCR, so we didn't need to read, you know, like two or 300 nucleotides. I think, you know, we are, with 100 nucleotide was more than enough to read the full um, barcode, and those already contain the Illumina sequences. So it was just one PCR. Of course, you need to titrate, and you need to check, you know, you want to do as many moon cycles as you can, because, you know, if you overexpress, if you overamplify, then you will, you will lose the linearity and it will not be quantitative. But I don't remember exactly how many cycles, but I'm sure there was you know, less than 20 cycles, probably in the order of five. And after that, we just purify those bands and we sequence those. And then the analysis is you know, kind of simple because every single read, and I think it was 99 point something, uh, all, all of them start with the same sequence that basically the oligo that we have used. And then we have the barcode. It's important to mention that when we, because the complexity of that PCR of that library is terrible because all of them start with the same nucleotide. So we were only sequenced like 30, I think 30 or 20% of a lane. So we were always spiking with some other RNA-seq library, normal RNA-seq library to have high um, complexity. So the first part of the analysis is basically to identify all the sequences that they start with the oligo that you have used. And then basically you count how many time you get each of the barcodes, and then you analyze that over time. I hope that, you know, and if not, you, please, everybody's welcome to write me if they want more technical, uh, or if okay. you want to use the pipeline that we have used. Okay, thank you. Um, more general question, uh, in terms of overall stability of mRNA, what do you think um, is the relative importance of the 5 from 3, 3 from UTR of codon optimization and poly A tail? Can you weigh those in any way? No, very, very good question. This is actually one work that uh, we are almost finishing now, and especially we are focusing that in, in early embryogenesis because it's a little bit easier. Uh, but we're also doing it in humans. So I would say it's, it's depend in, the RNA stability will depend in all of them. And of course, each case will going to be different. So for example, in the case of a zebrafish early embryogenesis, when they have this microRNA that's called Me430, that is extremely strong. Uh, if you have, a new, you know, microRNA is the way that they, they recognize the RNA, is based in complementary, complementarity. If you have a very strong complementarity, what is called like a, a having eight mers on eight nucleotide that match in a particular position of the microRNA, and if your messenger RNA contains three of those, well, that gene is going to be regulated mainly by me for by this microRNA. However, and we are doing reporters, if we play with the coron optimality or the coron composition, we can see differences between those. But overall, I would say um, we have been able to predict the half-life of the RNA in both zebrafish, xenopus, and human only based on the coron composition, suggesting that, you know, if you see that the global view, coron optimality is very likely the major determinant of RNA stability in, once again, zebrafish, xenopus, and human cell lines. Then we have all the other, all, all the other, um, 
features of the transcript that can also you know, compete or help with the current optimality to affect the instability. And say, the length of the 3 PMTR is important. You know, if we have micronase or not, it's important. If we have M6A, it's important. But I say, definitely, if, if we ignore completely, you know, what it would be, of course, a mistake, but, you know, we did this in purpose, the 3 PMTR, and we just measure the, uh, we can, you know, using machine learning, we can predict the half overall, you know, Globally, the R stability based on the current composition. I would say that is the most important one. But now, of course, we have all the other ones that they can compete or help current optimality. And with okay. respect, sorry, from the poly mm-hmm. in our reporters, we honestly have not seen any difference having the poly or the histone tail. So just in that I would say probably the poly here is not playing any, any, any important role. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question regarding the SLAMSEQ experiment you described. Did you do any studies to evaluate whether transcripts that had 4SU incorporated were translated differently from transcripts that did not get 4SU or those that had less 4SU incorporated? Well, that's a very good question, and that's something that we have been always thinking, where the 4SU could potentially affect translation, and that, in that case could potentially affect our result. Um, we have done only a few tests when, from other experiments. We have actually synthesized in vitro RNA with and without Fortayo, and we have injected those in zebrafish, and we have not seen, a diff- let's say, these are, let's imagine that you take, you know, GFP, a DNA vector of a GFP, you split it in two, in one you make the in vitro transcription in the presence of Fortayo, and then in the other ones you do uh, in the vitro transcription in the absence of portal UTP, and then you inject each of them, and then you measure GFP. And you know, we have not seen any big different, uh, any diff- a significant difference between the GFP that we were getting as well as the stability of the RNA that for us was also you know, another issue. Could it be that just incorporation of the fourth IU uh, UTP makes you more unstable? So well, so we have not seen any of those at least in the experiment that we have done. And that's why we are pretty excited about this technique uh, because, you know, it's, it, it's very nice to have a, you know, completely different method to address the same question. And that's something that we always like to do in the lab. All right, thank you. A uh, question regarding different types of transcription factors. Um, do homeo domain transcription factors have more optimal codons than transiently expressed tra- transcription factors uh, expressed only in development? Do you know? We have done some analysis, and let's say, but we not we have not done anything you know in, in very in, in this. What we can I can say that during the maternal choose agrotic transition, for example, we do see that genes that are enriching non-optimal codons are related with signal molecules. You know, if you do geo terms analysis, would it make sense because there's a lot of uh, signaling, uh, especially related with development that is happening during early embryogenesis. And genes are enriching optimal codons. They tend to be, during the maternal choose psychotic transition, they tend to be enrich, um, enriching geoterms uh, related with um, translation, with you know, housekeeping genes. Um, that's something that we so far we have not uh, gone in details, but there's something that definitely we want to analyze because now that we know the codon optimality in human, um, we will do those kind of experiments. And you can also start thinking that <clears throat> it's a little bit the same question, but in a different uh, angle. Now, if you have genes that you know you need to regulate it because they need to change over time, you might not want to have them enriching optimal codons because then it's going to be harder to modify them over time. Or you will depend exclusively in transcription. That, of course, that can also always happen. All right, thank you. Uh, can you say what about um, tRNA? So, do you see a relationship between codon usage and uh, tRNA stability or tRNA availability and codon optimality? So, with codon usage, you know, usually we have a lot of problems when we talk about optimality because people they go from codon usage directly. So, we do see a correlation between codon usage and optimality, but it's very, very weak. I mean, it's significant, but it's weak. So, you know. Rare codons, you know, codons that are almost not used, they tend to be non-optimal, but they are not exclusively non-optimal. 
and uh, colons are very frequently used. They tend to be good, but not exclusively. So actually, that comes. I think we are doing another project. With actually, we can potentially. I mean, we can optimize a gene based in our colon optimality knowledge, and that's actually you know they express better than if you just colon uh, optimize based in, on the usage. So they are not you know um, the correlation are are ex, you know are significant but pretty weak. And with respect to with the tRNA, you know it's uh, with that's something that we are very you know, just, Topic that we, we really love. The problem that we, we analyze tRNA level, you know, the two techniques that probably are the best out there for measuring tRNA level in human, you know, they still do the correlation are not extremely strong between them. And so it's very hard, you know, we do see this correlation every time in Xenopus, in Zebrafish, this also can be shown in yeast, um, that, you know, optimal quantum tend to have a higher level of tRNA, and now also we see with the charge ratio. Uh, I would not be surprised that when we, you know, other methods using maybe nanopore or other technique the, uh, tools, when we maybe can start, you know, analyzing the level of TNA in a better way, we might start seeing much stronger cor correlation. Saying that also, it's important. This beautiful work that has been done, for example, in, in in cancer cells, that in some particular cancer, especially in one type of breast cancer, there's one particular TNA that is get upregulated. And now the genes enriching that particular colons becomes more stable, and it looks like that is driving metastasis. So in that case, you know, you have a, like a kind of an in vivo system where tRNA has been has changed, and now the transcriptome is following those rules. It's very hard to overexpress or manipulate the level of tRNA. Usually, if you just simply overexpress the tRNA, you might probably, most of the cases, you are generating a dominant negative. Because now you have, for example, you can think in a very simple example, where now you have 10 times more tRNA, but now the, the ratio of charged tRNA drops completely. So now rather than making the tRNA better, you're making it worse. So, you know, in the future, I'm thinking about cancer and aging, it would be very interesting to see how tRNAs are regulated. That's definitely that. I hope in the next five years, we or others might be able to do it in a very precise way. All right. Thank you very much for elaborating, Ariel. So that's actually all the time we have today for questions. So let me thank our speaker, Ariel Bazzini, and our sponsor, Lexogen. And if we didn't have time to get to your question today, we will try to have one of our experts follow up with you. Again, as a reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide us with your feedback. And finally, if you missed any part of the seminar or you would like to listen to it again, we will send you an archived version via email. And that will also include the slide presentation? It's embedded. Yeah, it's embedded in there. Thank you. Okay, so with that, thank you very much again for attending this Genome Webinar. Thanks, Julia.